I'm David Griffin, it's the 3rd of August 2018, I'm here at Derbyshire County Cricket Club and I'm talking to... John Brown. John, um, we've already had uh, a 20 minute interview and we've only got as far as 1975 so we've got quite a way to go. Um, but in 1975 you moved up to Derbyshire, you bought a house and you were teaching in Derbyshire. So what was happening in your cricketing life in the mid-70s? Well. I was very sad to be leaving the two clubs that I'd been playing for in London because I'd got on very well with them and had really good friends but it seemed the right thing to do from a career and life point of view. Um, so when I came here there was a club called Hatton that the head teacher happened to be playing for as well and he encouraged me to play for them. Um, I very nearly didn't play because the first two matches I was put down as number five batsman and we won by eight wickets each time and I thought I'm going to go and look somewhere else so I went to Burton-on-Trent and uh, I, I didn't get round to joining Burton-on-Trent who were then a very strong club team, played in the Midlands League I think. What were Hatton playing in? They were playing in the Notts and Derby Border League right. as it was then. Yes. And uh, that eventually got swallowed up by the Derbyshire League, as quite a lot of the smaller leagues did in those days. So, uh, so what kind of teams were you playing, John, in, the, in that mid seventies period? You remember? Well, it was mostly in the Burton, Burton area. I'm just trying to think. Of, I might have said the wrong thing then. I think it may have just been the Burton and District League. Right. Um, so we were playing Woodville, Hartshorn, Marston's, several of the Burton breweries, Einkoot. So really local. Marston's. Yes, it was. It was much more local, and you know I haven't remembered it very correctly. I think there was a, a first division as another division but there was no promotion and relegation right. so it was top teams against the next best mainly village teams like Hatton yes. and uh, eventually I became secretary of that league and it was decided that we would have promotion and relegation and the clubs went along with that and so that happened and uh, how did you get into that side of it then, the, the, the official <coughs> or the administrative side? Well, as soon as I arrived, I went on an umpiring course because I wanted to learn more about it. And uh, that was run initially by Arthur Honeybun, I think. Mm. Very well known man. He You'd was be amazed how many times he's been mentioned uh, in different yeah, interviews on this project. Smashing bloke, yes. yeah, really a good man. Um, and uh, well people got to know me as a result of that and uh, even I kept on playing but was just fascinated by this umpiring side of things because I'd had to do quite a lot of that when I was running school cricket mm. um, you didn't employ umpires to come and do your games and I quite often with my school cricket stood there with a uh, with a board in hand and scoring and umpiring mm. at the same time um, people just got to know me as someone that was interested in that sort of thing and the previous secretary Phil Farron came to my house and asked would I be interested in taking over from him and I said fair enough I'll have a go at it and that meant I was secretary of the Burton District Cricket League and the fixture secretary and till I decided that I would give that up I'd had enough of playing league cricket and much more enjoyed the cricket that my Sunday team played which was Sutton on the Hill and I liked them because they played friendly proper cricket not overs cricket right and uh, that was always my favorite form of the game still is almost like first class cricket but in first the class and yeah. test cricket yeah. and what a wonderful test going on at the Absolutely. moment because it's proper cricket yeah. So, how, are you watching any cricket, John? Because I'm mindful at the moment you've got an umpire's course as you play and you're a teacher, you, you're an official, but are yeah. you able to watch any first class cricket? I would quite often go when I wasn't playing, particularly during the summer holidays, I would come and uh, watch at Derby because that was the nearest. Sometimes I'd go to Edgebaston, sometimes to Trent Bridge, but Derby almost entirely. 
And who were the players you you admired then? We talked about the players <coughs> in the fifties, but who were you? Who were the players that stood out for you in that mid late seventies period? Um, well, obviously Bob Taylor was a favourite. Um, Eddie Barlow. Um, Mike Hendrick was playing then regularly. And were you able to get to test matches at that time? Just the odd day. Yeah. Yes. I would always give preference to playing before going to watch even a test match. Yeah. So playing always came first, umpiring would come second. If I was an official scorer, that would be the next, and then watching is, was the fourth best. And were you ever, at this time, I'm talking the late 70s, did you find yourself scoring, or were you doing quite, two? Quite often, yes. Right. I would, I would score then? sitting in the crowd. Oh, right. So then I was one of those daft people right, that, yeah. that had I a school book on their laps. And yeah. So I can remember I was scoring when Crick was given out Handle the Ball. Really? And I thought, how wonderful I've yeah. seen a Handle the Ball. And never see that again. No, indeed, until, it's gone. until a few years later. Yeah, yeah so I, I saw it twice Jara, more. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually saw Michael Vaughan do it yeah. overseas. So, yes, so I reckon I'm maybe... The one person who's seen three first class handle the balls. What was the fascination in sitting in the crowd and doing it? And I ask because I've done it as well. But what? Yeah. What? Because you see people today will come, and sometimes they only watch one day of a four day game, but they'll score that one day. Yeah. What? What's the logic behind it? What was the? It partly makes you watch the game. Yeah. And it does mean that you've got snippets of information that you can show off to <laughs> people around you and saying that's three wickets in eight balls or whatever yeah. it was and, <laughs> um, you know, it just helped me concentrate and watch the game because so often you hear people say oh, I wish I'd been watching that oh what happened then they say and you had to try and describe the wonderful catch or the, yeah. the dozy running between the wickets or whatever it was it's an easy game isn't it to, to miss things because yeah. people often say to me what's the fascination with cricket and I always say it's the fellowship of the game it's the fact you can talk mm. to people and, and, and which you wouldn't do as a rugby match or a football no. match because you're much more intense but you're right it's an easy way to miss things because mm. you're sitting there talking about the weather or whatever yep. else it is you do um, so I'm mindful that you've got this career as a teacher. Did you stay in teaching for the rest of your working life? Um, the Derbyshire education people decided they were going to reorganise in uh, 19, well, the late 1980s. And um, one of the things they were going to do was to close four comprehensive schools and combine with other schools. And the school I was at, Hatton Comprehensive, was one of the schools that they were going to close. We fought it like mad, wanting it to continue, but in the end, the inevitable happened and Hatton School was closed. And they offered me early retirement. And uh, I thought, well, fair enough. Thank you very much, I'll, I'll take it. The, I think they gave an extra £5,000 and seven years uh, pension enhancement. And I thought, fair enough, I'll be able to watch a bit more cricket. <laughs> so did cricket become the beneficiary? Was, was that the, the I think end I, result? Well, the very first thing that I gained was that I was able to now go on overseas tours watching England. And so that very first winter, 1990-91... Oh, the West Indies tour. No, it was Australia. That one I'm... Oh, no. Oh. No, I... Yes, 1991, it was... I'm trying to think of the first one that was shown on Sky Sports, which was uh, the... It was, was certainly Australia I went to really? first. Um, I think it was... The, we'll look it up after this yes, interview. Yes, we can... <laughs> I've got my wisdom with me. Yeah. Um, yes, so I, I went there and... Uh, Gooch and Stewart were playing. Which test did you go with? Did you go to? I think I saw the last three. Um, it would have been Sydney, which I think was the first. Perth, I think, was the last in those days. Still is. Um, Adelaide, I'm pretty sure. Mm. Yeah. So. Those are the and three. was that a dream you'd always wanted to go on? A, a I'd always to... thought. Yes, yeah, since the days when I'd listen to 30 minutes under the bedclothes and 30 minutes at the beginning of the day 
as it was when we were out in Australia or in the early 50s, I think, we had a tour out there. That might have been 50 to 51, yeah. Freddie Brown's team. And you just got 30 minutes, if you were lucky, if the reception if you was you had the radio to stay in tune, yeah. that was all the right. biggest problem, wasn't yeah. it? So, um, obviously, we, we, we're moving now to Wanjong, the redundancy and... Oh, the that was 1990. 1990, so yeah. it's still another decade or so before you become the Derbyshire scorer, so I'm assuming that in that intervening period there must have been a progression of you your as a scorer. I'm, I'm making that assumption, I don't know, but yeah. what, what were you doing as a scorer in, that, in the 90s? Um, well, I was still playing right through the 90s, so scoring became a less important part of my life, although I was now instructing both umpires and scorers, running courses for them. Um, that's at local level? Yes, yes, that would be Burtner District. So I was running those courses and I kept coming and watching and keeping score on uh, the linear type of score sheet, which I was learning about. And one of my early tours overseas, I met a couple from Edgbaston, Red Walker, who was the medical officer for Warwickshire. And he said, why don't you come and watch more at Edgbaston? And I did, and went and sat with them. And as a result, got to know the Warwickshire scorer. Um, partly as a result of that, he also ran the advanced scoring correspondence course, Alex Davis. And uh, I was able to go and see him in his room and eventually heard that he was retiring. I saw it on CFAX and I thought, I wonder... Is that worth applying for? So I did apply at Edgbaston and was called for interview along with two other people. I came second in the interview, the winner of it being someone who worked on the school board for five years already, so I think he was almost written in before mm. I was. And uh, that was... And because he had a test match, they had to have a reserve scorer who would score their first team games when uh, the test match was on and that was where I did I made my first class debut at Maidstone when Kent were hosting Warwickshire and uh, I had a four day match and a one day match down there Which year was that John? That was 99 and Worst grounds to make your debut quite nice of a Very pleasant quite spot quite yes nice. and the, the Kent scorer looked after me very nicely Jack Foley um, who's now retired from scoring, but still going. Um, did you have expectations at that time, John, of, of, a, of moving further, or did you just think this was kind of a one-off or an occasional well, foray into... I expected that I would be the reserve scorer until David Wainwright had retired, but then I heard that Stan Tacey was retiring, mainly because his wife was so ill and he needed to look after her. And I thought... I went to John Smedley, who was in charge at the time, and just said, if you're looking for a scorer, I'm the one... I'm, I'm, no, I didn't say I'm the one. <laughs> I, I am available. And he said, thank goodness for that. And I believe they didn't want Trevor Cotton to do the work. I, I don't know why, but uh, they were looking for someone else, and uh, I was virtually given the job on the spot without... Well, obviously, it was an interview, but there were no... There was no opposition, so I was very lucky in that respect. And yeah, Stan did it for a long time, and actually when you look back on scorecards and when you look now in the score box and you see the same scorers for year after year, what do you think? What, there is a longevity, isn't there, to scorers? Is, is it just the attraction of the job, or they don't know when to stop? Or what, what, what is it? Because they do seem to go on forever and ever. There are some people who don't know when to stop, and <laughs> I hope that when it is time for me to stop, I shall know that it's time. But it's a wonderful job to have. There's much more to it, and uh, you get to meet the players and get to know them as friends rather than just people that you admire from a distance and that you're slightly jealous of for being so good at doing what you would have wanted to do if you possibly could. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll call a halt there because I mm -hmm. think it's an appropriate time, having just discussed your first-class debut, to perhaps start the next interview with your, um, if you like, your debut for Derbyshire. Mm -hmm. So thank you for now, John, and we'll talk to you again shortly. Righto.